Okay, in the previous lecture, we we um, developed the difference between uh, a Lagrangian and a Eulerian meshes. Um, and today I want to talk about, within the Lagrangian mesh framework, we can talk about what's called a total Lagrangian and an updated Lagrangian uh, formulation. So I want to um, uh, begin by that. Okay, so let me remind you what we've done. Okay, so previously we defined Lagrangian and Eulerian coordinates. Right, and we called them capital X for the Lagrangian and C for the Eulerian. I'll say this is respectively. Okay, uh, here we're going to consider a Lagrangian mesh. Right, so here uh, we're going to look at a Lagrangian mesh. We're not actually going to draw the mesh, but uh, we consider a Lagrangian mesh. Right, which means we're going to track material points. Um, and we want to describe uh, two different material descriptions. Okay, those descriptions are going to be, one will be called the total Lagrangian, uh, and the other will be the updated Lagrangian. Okay, and why do these arise? These arise uh, because we can describe a material point uh, either by its initial coordinates, maybe rather its initial location, which we would call X, right? That's the label that we give it. Or uh, by its current location, which we'll denote with its Eulerian coordinate C, okay? So these two descriptions are related uh, to the motion of a body, okay? So we can relate these Let's say the current position C of the point X at a given time is just equal to some mapping phi, which describes that uh, uh, the trans translation of that point, right? Something like that. So uh, pretty basic, but it's just we're just describing it now as a mapping. Okay, so the location um, at of this this uh, Material point X at some time uh, gives us this current location C, okay? So what is phi, right? It's a vector mapping that gives a spatial position of uh, any material point X at time T, okay? We could also write the other, right? We could write... Um, uh, we want, if we want to know, uh, at a particular point, what is the material point that's located there, we could do that too. Okay. So let's just say, kind of as a corollary, similarly, we could write the following. We could say that X, right, of the, so that's the material point now, at any point in, at some point in time and location, right, is going to be equal to we would write this now as just the inverse mapping. Okay? Call that equation two. One thing I want to want to uh, point out here, as we said, and we continue, we're going to continue to use, that X, big X, the material point location, doesn't depend on time, right? It's a label. So this equation number two I'm not actually saying that X is a function of time. Uh, what I'm saying is that the um, the material point that's at that position might vary in time, right? So it's it's a slightly it's a subtle difference, but an important one because X is a label, uh, and it it is simply uh, let's call it you know A, right? A doesn't vary in time. It, this location might might we're just interested in where A resides at any given point in time. Okay. So let's first define now the displacement. Okay, so the displacement of a, of a material point is just the difference between its current location and its original location, right? Right, so that's easy to write. We can write that uh, U, right, the displacement, which is, let's say, we're interested in the displacement of material point uh, X uh, in time. How does it move in time? It's going to just be equal to C, Right, that's just his current position minus its original position, which is just x. Let's call that equation three. 
right? So that's pretty straightforward. How about the velocity? All right, so the velocity of a material point is going to be given by, so let's say velocity, and this is of a material point, right? So I want to know the velocity of that material point x at some time t, right? Well, that must be then the partial derivative with respect to time of u, right? The partial, the partial derivative with respect to time of the displacement. How does the displacement change with time? That gives me the velocity of that point, which is going to be equal to uh, now the partial of c, location of that point in, uh, okay, uh, minus the partial of x with respect to time. We're interested in looking at point x, so point x isn't changing with time, right? It's a label. That goes to zero, and we're left with the solution that it's the partial of the current. We should make this a vector. The partial of the current uh, position, right, with respect to, to, to time. Let's call that equation four. Okay, one thing I want to point out about equation four, it's tempting to think of this as a velocity field. It's actually not. Okay, so I'm going to note that here for you, and I'll ask you to think about why isn't it a field. So equation four uh, is the velocity of the material point x, right, at a point in time. It is not a velocity field. Okay? Why is it not a velocity field? Because a velocity field would be what is the velocity at a particular location? That's not what we're asking here. We're asking what is the velocity of a particular point at a particular time? Okay, so in contrast, we could write a velocity field. Okay, so a velocity field would be the following, right? If we said want the velocity at some location in space defined by c as a function of time, right? We could do that, and we can relate it to the velocity that we've got up here. But we would have to do a mapping, right? It must be the velocity of what? The inverse of that mapping, right? So it's this is going to return the material point uh, at that location at that time, something like that, right? Call that equation five, right? That's a, that's a velocity field now, and I should make that a vector as well. Okay, so I went, I held up, I only scrolled a little way up because I want you to note something. Okay? Uh, compare equations four and five. Right, equations four and five, uh, both describe velocity. Right? But they're gonna, they're gonna, they're doing it using different independent variables. Right? So one, equation four, uses an independent variable that's the material point x and Equation five uses a uh, independent variable that is C, right? So in general, even though they are both describing the velocity, they're not going to in general be the same functions. Okay, this, this idea sort of um, leads us uh, to two but two different but equivalent formulations for a Lagrange FEA solution. Okay. Okay, the first Right. What is the what is it, what idea is it lead to? It says that we can probably formulate the solution with respect to x, the the material point, uh, in its re in its reference state, and we can probably formulate it with respect to c, which is the location of the material point at it uh, in in the current time. Okay. So that's how we define separate these uh, two types out. So the total Lagrangian approach. Uh, all of the derivatives and integrals are going to be with respect uh, to x, right, our material point. In what's called the updated Lagrangian, okay, all derivatives and integrals are with respect to, to the current position c, okay? Why haven't you worried about this before? Because before now, when we talked about linear elastic materials, 
um, in a small strain formulation, we, we don't see a distinction really between a total Lagrangian and an updated Lagrangian formulation. When we move to nonlinear uh, problems, uh, we need to be able to um, account for that. Okay? So, uh, if you don't, if you're not totally certain what we're doing, don't panic yet. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna derive both a total Lagrangian form, a form and an updated Lagrangian form for a 1D FEA problem. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then hopefully after we do that, uh, this will all make a lot more sense.